speaker is Gail Castle. Um, Dr. Castle is um, a senior lecturer on global health uh, and social medicine at Harvard Medical School. She's the executive vice president for TB drug development at the Infectious Disease Research Institute, professor emeritus and former chair of the Department of Microbiology at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. She previously served as the Vice President for Scientific Affairs and Distinguished Lilly Research Scholar for Infectious Diseases at Eli Lilly and Company. The list of boards she sits on or chairs is way too long to list here, uh, but it has included the Burroughs Welcome Fund, the Board of Scientific Counselors at the CDC, the NIH the Board of Trustees, uh, and chances are she might have been on the board or is on the board of your very own academic institution. Um, she is a member of the Institute of Medicine and regularly advises governmental agencies, NGOs, and companies on TB drug development and diagnostic development. On a personal note, uh, Gail has graciously uh, provided sage advice and support to me since we first met in Boston and Peru, uh, now almost 10 years ago. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce her to you guys today and give her a chance to share some of that sage advice uh, with you all. When Jonathan asked me if I would be willing to participate in this session, it was a weaker moment, and I said, yes, I'd be delighted to. And then as I began to try to prepare what I was going to say, it became a real challenge. <laughs> it's like the one commencement address that I've given in my lifetime, I thought this would be really easy, but it, it's not so easy. And so um, I want to say, Jonathan, you I don't know if you appreciated the fact that in industry, there's a 90% failure rate. And Steve, to your point, almost um, only 1% of employees, 10,000 plus, in a large pharma company like Lilly will ever touch a drug that actually gets FDA approval. So 90% failure rate from the target identification to approval, a 50% failure rate even in phase two clinical studies. So. Failure, uh, failures for me, after having spent a number of years in industry, I don't really look at them as failures. And as I begin to try to think of what I could share that might be meaningful, and thinking from the title that it would be mostly young people that would show up for a session like this because older people think they already know about too many failures. And I'm pleased to see that many of you, most of you in the audience are indeed young, so I've geared my comments toward young people in their earlier stages of their career and tried to focus on what I think might be most helpful. And so what I decided to do, Jonathan, is to uh, talk about failures resulting in unintended consequences but unimaginable opportunities that arise almost from every failure. And it kind of eventually just becomes natural. Once you fail, you know, you know what you have to do. And so I'm going to talk about converting unintended consequences to unimaginable opportunities, share a few examples. You asked me to give perspectives from industry and academia and the convergence of the two. And then as I began to think about what I would share with you, I realized how much of an impact on you know, what I've ended up doing for my entire career actually was based on the fact that I spent a lot of time on these boards, as you call them, for FDA, on the science board, and I used the director's advisory committee, Fogarty board, et cetera. And so it's really a, my perspectives from industry, academia, and government that I'd like to share with you today and then to um, give you a few personal examples and hopefully maybe you might benefit from some of what I have to say. So first of all, I'd like to emphasize one thing. I was asked to give the, um, a keynote address to the NIH postdocs at their annual meeting. And what do you said for, I said, yeah, sure, I'll do this. And then it was, okay, what the heck do I say? And then I realized that it really is the intangible skills that one develops in your training that end up being the most important determinant, I think, of success, the intangible skills that you acquire over time. So then what might be guiding principles in terms of developing these intangible skills? 
So I would say first it's important to have career goals, absolutely essential, Jonathan, as we talked about this morning. But it's equally important to be open to opportunities in the face of failure. Follow your instincts in terms of what you think you want to do um, and what you think uh, is, is the right approach to resolving that failure. But to do the right thing always, that is a natural. And then number two, to remember success is about adding unique value to whatever you do and that there's absolutely no substitute, getting back to Steve's point, for tenaciousness and perseverance. So um, I would say, based on my perspectives, that, and especially looking at the academia industry experience, that for me the biggest, absolute biggest challenge, and even today, is the constant tension and the need to maintain this delicate balance of the perspectives of industry, academia, and government and their intersection, making people like Steve appreciate what it takes to discover a drug and why <coughs> drugs are expensive to develop and why the failure rate is um, high and making them accessible by reducing prices is sometimes not so easily accomplished based on many different things. So just to, to kind of um, a background, quick background summary of uh, the journey, and that is that I spent most of my career at UAB, as Jonathan mentioned, and also uh, chairing the Board of, of Public and Scientific Affairs at ASM and ultimately being president of ASM. And I only mention that because I'll come back to it at the very end and hopefully in discussions and how important I think uh, participation in scientific societies are in translating research into policy. And then um, the next thing is the odd thing, it, one of the reasons I ended up going to Lilly was because at the same time I was on the NIH Director's Advisory Committee chairing the Board of Scientific Counselors at, at um, mm. CDC and being president of ASM and the focus of most of that time had to do with antimicrobial resistance. And uh, being one of the authors of the last uh, Office of Technology Assessment reports which turned out to be uh, on antimicrobial resistance, starting, in fact, trying to publicize the fact that we were running out of antibiotics. This was way back in 1994, if you will, uh, and when everybody thought the drug pipeline was completely filled. But, in fact, that turns out not to be the case. But at any rate, when Eli Lilly asked me to join them as vice president of uh, drug discovery, infectious drug discovery, and clinical development, I, it took them eight months to convince me to come, but I had decided to go because I realized the need. Also, having kind of been at that intersection of industry, academia, and government, saw the potential of going to industry and then maybe trying to bring those partners together. We can talk about uh, that more, the partnerships, um, in the discussion period. But one of the unanticipated consequences of deciding to give up my endowed chair at UAB and the chairman going to industry was that just as uh, many people would have predicted, if you know industry and the, the need to react quickly and adjust, is that uh, unbeknownst to, to anybody within the Lilly, the Prozac patent, which was our major money maker, actually expired about four or five years earlier than anybody anticipated that it would. And this was unprecedented in industry. But Lilly had to make some very tough decisions, and I was part of that. And it was to exit the infectious disease, drug discovery, drug development um, efforts, because most of the other large farmers were doing the same thing because of the fact that, uh, well, many reasons. We can talk about it later. But what happened, this happened really about only three years after I got to Lilly, so not a lot of time. We had some successes in those three years. We can talk about those. But what happened is 9-11, and because I'd spent so much time making policies around bioweapons as ASM president, co-chairing the committee that reversed the decision to destroy the U.S. smallpox stocks and a few other things, Pharma asked if I could go on loan from Lilly to serve as the chief scientist for Pharma right after 9-11 and serve as a liaison with industry and government and academia in terms of, of trying to develop um, 
countermeasures. Um, and we can talk about what that entailed and, and why I think that was important at the time. Um, the other thing that happened is that I happened to be serving on the IOM um, Council, the Institute of Medicine Council. There was no, there had been a defunct effort in terms of a forum uh, for drug discovery and drug development. And so they asked if I would restart that now that I was in industry, probably the last thing I would ever expected to do within the Institute of Medicine, but I'll tell you what the consequences of that were. Ended up having to spend a heck of a lot of time on conflict of interest issues and chairing a committee to be the arbitrator between the journal editors, including Lancet, New England Journal, et cetera, et cetera, and industry to register every clinical trial. We can talk about that in this delicate balance between the perspectives of industry, government, and academia. And then to what I'll spend most of my time doing is to talk about the first 30 days at Lilly that ended up dictating what I would do for two decades, uh, something I would have never imagined, and that would be to focus my efforts on TB policy and drug development as a consequence. And none of this would have been possible because I wouldn't have had to have time if I were vice president for drug discovery and development in infectious diseases. But because an opportunity opened up to go into policy to do other things at Lilly, it allowed me time to devote to um, this last effort that I want to share with you. So one point I'd like to make that never forget, and that is that you, regardless of how busy you are, when the opportunities arise, really consider them carefully and don't discount them just because you're busy with all your other obligations. One of those came from Josh Letterberg. Some of you may or may not know him, but he was one of my main mentors. I uh, never made a big move uh, without talking to Josh and then one day he called me up and said, I'm going to ask you to do something and you can't say no. So who am I to say no to a Nobel laureate and somebody who's, you know, given me his advice on every move I've made. And that was to go to Russia in the first delegation to have serious discussions uh, with former bioweapons scientists. And I'm smiling at Jim LaDuke because he reminded me this morning he was in our group of five that went on that first delegation. So at any rate, um, the Russia experience turned out to be have a big influence. But it was certainly an unanticipated ask and uh, something that ended up uh, having a great impact on, on what I have done for the remainder of my time. I uh, want to make a case for mentors and networks. I know you are probably really tired of hearing about this, but I want to tell you about two main things. Uh, one is a simple phone call, and the other uh, was over a cup of coffee and what that resulted in. It was all because of mentors and connecting with mentors and networks and being able to reach out to people to do things. So one month after I got to Lilly, I got a call from the CEO Randy DeBias, and said that he had had a call from Al Gilman, also Nobel laureate, who was a member of Lilly's board and had been a long-term member even before he won the Nobel Prize, that said he had had a call from this professor at Harvard, Howard Hyatt, and um, that uh, Lilly had to address his concern. That concern was that Howard Hyatt had two young faculty at Harvard that were trying to uh, do a clinical trial in Lima, Peru, in the slums to prove that if you did it right, you could effectively cure patients with multidrug resistant TB. And so uh, it just so happened that Howard and I were serving on a National Academies committee together at the time. So when Randy said it was Howard Hyatt that had called uh, Randy to, I mean, that called um, Al Gilman. I said, sure, I, I'll, I'll, I, I can do this, right? It was one of the first things I was asked to do. At any rate, so what does an academic do in industry? Or if you want to really try to, to have serious collaborations, you invite somebody to come give a seminar and find out you know, what each other's doing. So I called Howard, invited him to come to Lilly. And uh, so he did a few months later to give a seminar along with some of his two young professors, one of the two young professors. One person, I kid you not, one person in Lilly showed up for the seminar, myself and Howard and the young assistant professor. <laughs> Big embarrassment. But it was the, you know, it was a good thing. 
because we, I had Howard meet with our CEO and my boss and literally decided they would provide the drugs free of charge to these young assistant professors. The reason Howard was calling is that two, two young assistant professors were getting the drugs to treat the patients with MDRTB from the hospital pharmacy at Brigham and Women's, and they had run out of money and run up big bills on their credit cards, and then they, so Lily had to do something. So Lily decided to provide the drugs to allow them to continue to do uh, the trial, and uh, what all of this resulted in is in the summer of 2003, Lily committed $7 million, and ultimately, over 250, and I actually think it may be up to 300 million today in a philanthropic effort around the two old drugs that were over a half century old when we got this phone call. And actually, it's one of the largest single philanthropic efforts in pharma history, as it turns out, all based on a phone call that was described in the Boston Globe 10, uh, 10 years later. And in fact, those two young professors were not just anybody. One was Paul Farmer, the other Jim Kim. As most of you know, Jim Kim is serving his second term as president of the World Bank. So he went from, from being an assistant professor to president, youngest pre, uh, president of Dartmouth and then on to the World Bank. And Paul, many of you in global health, I would be surprised if not all of you have certainly heard of him. But all of this resulted from a phone call a single phone call from a mentor of Paul and Jim, and then um, being able to, to network. So the reason that was so important is that at that time, in 1997, the policy of WHO was that MDR2B was too expensive to treat in poor countries. It detracts attention and resources from treating drug-susceptible disease, and hopefully we'll have time to talk about this. Uh, let's see, uh, what should I say? Uh, <clears throat> Mis, 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 uh, interpretation <laughs> and other other things, but the rest is history. In that they were able, through Lilly funding the uh, rest of the clinical trial, to show and publish the results of the the trial from Peru, documenting that if done appropriately, you could successfully treat patients with an 83 to 86 percent cure rate if they were treated appropriately and you monitored the side effects uh, carefully enough. So uh, <clears> the <throat> only thing I want to say is that, that in the philanthropic effort that Lilly um, established uh, as a result of that visit by Howard Hyatt and Jim Kim, it was all-encompassing in terms of making our two existing drugs matter um, and also involved technology transfer. Because of the history and knowledge of Russia, one of our first efforts was to transfer manu GMP manufacturing practices to a small company in Russia, then South Africa, and um, also China. But um, at any rate, uh, as co-chair of the drug forum in the IOM, uh, it seemed to me that, that there were a lot of misbeliefs and practices that uh, were not appropriate as it related to multi-drug resistant TB. So, uh, I was lucky and convinced IOM that we should do some fact-finding. So over a period of uh, the next four years, we actually had four meetings uh, beginning in the U.S. and then in each one of the highest disease burden countries. Learned a lot in so doing. But um, you would think that, that in, and in fact, greatly reduced the price of the two old drugs and provided it to the WHO drug facility that fed into the Green Light Committee at the time. Uh, et cetera, and one would have hoped that the community, the TB community, would um, have been a lot more appreciative than they were, but instead we were continually harassed because we weren't developing new TB drugs. Even We were doing all of this in the face of the fact that we exited infectious diseases back in, in 2000. So at any rate, we realized that the short-term solution was make the existing drugs matter, but obviously that the long-term solution was to develop new drugs. So a case for being open to new opportunities. We were having a senior executive retreat at Lilly, and um, we, I was getting coffee. An individual that was doing negotiations for Lilly to purchase a small biotech company in Seattle was getting a cup of coffee at the same time, and I said, Gino, because he, he said, 
that we were having a hard time in Seattle. Seattle was really upset because, uh, because uh, in fact, we were closing the plant and the Seattle was losing jobs. So what, is it, what could we do about it? And I said, Gina, we should convert everything to uh, basically discovering new TB drugs. So the rest is history over a cup of coffee. He says, if we are successful, you can have it. So at any rate, we established the Lilly TB Drug Discovery Initiative, which is not for profit, at the Infectious Disease Research Institute in Seattle. Luckily, through partnerships, key partnerships, uh, we have a new TB drug in late development. We went back to our partners in China and signed an agreement with them last spring to uh, commercially develop uh, the TB drug. Running out of time, so I'll just show one more slide, and that is that, again, a small delegation that you may have heard about from uh, Stanford was asked by the government of North Korea and the U.S. State Department if they would entertain a small delegation from North Korea because they needed drugs to treat multidrug-resistant TB. Stanford was hesitant to ask me to come. <laughs> although two of the four drugs they needed were the Lilly, oh, Lilly drugs, but never mind, the State Department called and asked if I would come. I said yes. Turns out I was able to get funds to establish a TB diagnostic lab in North Korea that's functioning today, and I'm happy to say has had an impact. The most difficult challenge about being in industry and adversity, facing adversity, came from the UN committee that followed the famous UN summit that developed the uh, Millennium Development Goals. I was on the committee that uh, basically was focused on uh, a, um, HIV, AIDS, malaria, and other diseases. Note, TB wasn't even included in the title. Um, and I was one of only 300 committee members that was from industry. Everybody else was from academia and NGOs, which was not a good experience. I don't have time to go into it. But I wanted to just bring to your attention that just, in fact, the past month, there was a high-level um, meeting of the General Assembly, the first ever in the UN on TB, because it's now such a crisis, so a failure. Through all of this, we still have now TB killing more people than HIV and malaria combined. So with that, I will stop to take home messages. Is that careers in biomedical sciences are unpredictable, be opportunistic, persistent. Failure leads to unimaginable opportunities. And base, always be sure your policies on sound science and engage in the scientific um, society's engagement is absolutely critical. Thank you. Thanks, Gail. Thank you. Unless there's any burning questions, we might just save them for the panel.